What's up with y'all? It's been a little while. Learned a little, as you can see. I ain't gonna know what I'm talking about, but secret 10 year mission to an alien planet 40 light years away, Project Serpo. I'm not glitching no more. I finally figured it out. <laughs> Shout out Elgato. It's on both screens, man. Without further ado, let's get straight into the video. Wi-Fi Files, one of the best channels on YouTube. Today's episode of The Wi-Fi Files is brought to you by Established Titles. What if you were offered the opportunity to visit another planet? You'd get to experience the culture of an alien race, explore a new world, see and use technology that's 5,000 years ahead of ours. Would you do it? Well, before you answer, there are a few catches. You'll be gone at least 10 years. And when you return to Earth, all evidence of your existence will be erased. You have to start a new life with a new identity forbidden to tell anyone about what you experienced. Now, would Me, personally, it depends. I have to see the archetypes of the females. If I approve, I'm going. If not, no. Did you do it? Well, in 1965, 12 astronauts were sent to an alien planet as part of a human alien exchange program. 13 years later, they returned home. Well, most of them did. The mission commander wrote a 3,000 page report of everything the team experienced. First alien contact, the 40 light year trip to the alien world, and everything that happened on the planet. This is the true story of Project Serpa. When Colonel McKeever of the United States Air Force arrived at Fort Leavenworth, he was excited, but he didn't have much information. All he knew is that he was selected from hundreds of candidates to command the most important space mission in the history of the human race. That's quite a description. Naturally, he asked for details about the mission, but was told he would be briefed during training. McKeever did know the mission was gonna be long, 10 years, plus almost a year for training and another year in quarantine at the end of the mission. So 12 years away from home. It was 1965, so he wouldn't be back until the late 70s. Now for most people, this would be difficult, but McKeever had no relatives, no wife, no kids, and very few friends. His life was the Air Force. As far as he was concerned, he could leave for 12 years or 20. It was all the same to him. And that was a good thing because another condition of the mission is that he was to be sheep dipped. Sheep dipped? Well, sheep dipped is an intelligence term used to describe identities that are made to disappear. All records, military, civilian, school records, social security, DMV, IRS, it's like you never existed. No, I wouldn't mind disappearing from the IRS. I understand that. Tax is a theft! Colonel McKeever parked his car and was met by a young military police officer. After exchanging salutes, they walked in silence to an office building at the edge of the base. The outside of the building was nondescript, painted that gray, green, beige color that the military used for everything. The inside of the building was very different though. As a colonel, McKeever had been in plenty of secure buildings, but nothing like this. Metal detectors, cameras everywhere, armed guards posted in every hallway. McKeever's escort motioned to an elevator. McKeever asked, you're not coming with me? The young man said no, he didn't have clearance. He saluted and the elevator doors closed. McKeever felt the elevator taking him several stories down. He noticed there were no buttons in the elevator, no indication of the number of floors. The elevator doors opened and another young man was waiting. McKeever noticed his badge said Air Force Office of Special Investigations. As far as Colonel McKeever knew, OSI was a law enforcement agency. He had no idea what they would be doing here, but he knew not to ask. McKeever entered the briefing room, which looked like a classroom. There were 11 people seated. He saw two army uniforms, two Navy, and the rest were Air Force. At the front of the room was another Air Force Colonel that McKeever didn't recognize who told him to take a seat. The other Colonel said to the group, what I'm about to show you is classified beyond top secret. There are fewer than 60 people in the world who know this information. If you repeat what you learn here today, you'll be charged with treason, understood? The group nodded slowly, clearly aware of the weight of the situation. The colonel pulled down a screen and called to someone to get the lights. On the screen, a black and white film began to play. The first few seconds were the typical warnings about unauthorized viewing and other disclaimers that Colonel McKeever had seen a thousand times. The footage showed what appeared to be the desert at night, though it was hard to tell, the footage seemed to be 20 years old. Then a title came on the screen that McKeever didn't expect. It read, Roswell, New Mexico, 1947, First Contact. The film lasted about an hour and left everyone in the room stunned. They had heard of Roswell and the supposed UFO crash, 
The Air Force said it was a weather balloon and that explanation was good enough for McKeever. The film explained that the UFO crash in Roswell did happen, though technically the crash was in Corona, New Mexico. And two years later, in 1949, another UFO crashed nearby. Now, this was something McKeever didn't know. And there was footage of the Roswell recovery. At first, it was difficult to understand what he was looking at. It was clearly metal wreckage, but it could have been a plane for all McKeever knew. Then he saw it. Hiding behind a rock was an alien. It looked like aliens look in science fiction movies. Short, pale skin, large head with huge black eyes, small nose and mouth. The military called this creature Extraterrestrial Biological Entity 1, or EVA-1. EVA-1 was the lone survivor of the crash. Five other alien bodies were taken away. There was also footage of the 1949 crash. It was a similar craft, silver, saucer-shaped, and there were six bodies there and no survivors. EVA-1 was taken to the Air Force facility at Los Alamos, and according to the briefing, he stayed there until his death in 1952. The Air Force learned a great deal from EVA-1 in those five years. At first, communication was difficult. EVA-1's language... Let me know what you guys would do. If you was in the room and you was briefed about something that's top security and it shouldn't be disclosed to no one, are you disclosing it still, or are you keeping keeping up this thing with let's say the government because they are on cahoots me personally i'm not the truth must come to light no matter what even though a lot of people gonna still hear it and it's gonna sound it's gonna sound crazy so a lot of people still ain't gonna believe you but me personally i'm gonna expose i'm gonna expose the truth i'm gonna disclose the information what i was briefed about i don't owe no allegiance to the government to the navy to none of that I understand that I'm indigenous and aboriginal to the land. I understand these people don't have a biological identification to the planet. But yet, somehow they own and run everything. I have a problem with that. Take it a step further, what happened to the ancestors? And yes, it's still relevant because the past, present, and future is all happening simultaneously. I've been knew that, but scientists can prove it to you now. That's how you time travel. You either go forward or backwards, right? So I say that to say, my ancestors, they pain they want and they get back and all that still ripple throughout the universe the energy just transferred it ain't went nowhere and if i was them take it a step further i look at it from their perspective if that happened i don't care if it was a trillion years ago i still want my get back no matter the day age era and i still wouldn't forgive it if the people that's indigenous aboriginal come to own their things again and y'all went away i still wouldn't forgive it because you still did something I believe in the app for both of your eyes if you did it on purpose, and you did it on purpose. So, yeah, I don't owe the, the government allegiance about shit. They own everything somehow. And everything they've done. And it's still prevalent. The traumas that run throughout your bloodline 15 generations, plus through epigenetic memory pass down through your RNA, so you got to rewrite your DNA with affirmations and the corresponding feeling and thinking better and neuroplasticity because of I was born here involuntarily with this shit in my veins because of what your forefathers did. Low bearing fruit doesn't fall too far about the tree. <sighs> it doesn't fall too far from the tree. Let me know how you feel. Me personally, when I see them, I see all of it. My Gekyo Sharingan, I unlocked my third Timoy 2 winter solstice ago. I see everything. I'm not like you. So that's on my mind and a whole slew of tornadoes and volcanoes and locust swarms and most shit I know about. So you think I'm finna give some allegiance or loyalty to them? No, I'm loyal to the mission and the truth and it must be disclosed up by any means necessary. Let me know what you think. That's what I'm doing personally. I don't care who you coming for the family. I don't I don't care about none of that. Understanding thermodynamics energy can't be created nor destroyed. It's only gonna transfer. I can't die anyway. You could take the vessel, the vehicle, but I'm going to disclose the truth, buddy. Let's continue. It was comprised of tones, not words. But through hand gestures and repetition, Eva One was able to communicate. He said that his race, which the military called the Evans, had been Evans. visiting Earth for 2,000 years. On this trip, something caused his ship to crash. Eva One suspected it was radar, which was a technology his people didn't have. Some equipment was salvaged Very from Eva One's craft. Specifically, a communication device. Eva One offered to share this technology if the military would allow him to repair it so he could contact his people. 
Of course, the military agreed. Ibu One was able to get the communicator working again and sent several messages, but never received a reply. I hate to keep pause now. I might break this up into two parts, but life is so intricate, multisyllabic, and unfathomable because some things is unutterable for it exists as an entity in lanes which transcends our material words or symbols some things that have to be experienced by the individual and there's no words to utter i say that to say life is is so crazy that you're praying to god Ash, akbar elohim or whoever you praying to whole time you got the government that's in cahoots with these deep state motherfuckers that's they you praying and they praying on kids and they trade and technology in exchange for them being letting the humans get abducted it's all kind of shit going on if you would have told my grandma's mom that this would be possible she'd have said you a goddamn lie and hit you upside your shit with a frying pan but yet it's real it's crazy how i can facetime a friend and goddamn korea or something like it's crazy how i can do that so you want to know what's the next step above that actually putting your hand through there and being able to go through there this would have been impossible, but yeah, it's possible when you take it for granted. It's the norm. You don't even really look at it. It goes under your nose. But yeah, forced to even get this advanced or acquire this kind of technology, it was definitely a trade-off, and you're still being traded. More than 800,000 kids go missing annually in the U.S. alone, right? So it's all kind of shit you wouldn't believe going on. It's some Caillou's that's playing with them and incest molestation pedophilia bestiality the other portion of kids getting ate by gilgamishes and giants the other portions getting abducted by aliens or organ harvesting on the deep state ip encrypted dark web it's life really like that i hope you know that why are you occupied at your occupation once more job is the finest public business for private dishonest gain why are you honestly working hard at somebody privately eating private parts gaining dishonestly after your hard work and labor that has to suck dick just know that life really like that and i understand two thirds won't make it so two it's going it's going to be one out of three that's going and the mass majority is dumb deaf or blind one of the three two of the three are all three i will argue most are all three all three i say that to say most people are in these sects and religious and giving their religion that's that's giving your energy to an external source most people do that by default whatever the mass majority do i'm doing the opposite that's just my nature and i understand this kind of shit going on like it's aliens all around this bit and they not praying to your elohims but let's continue and this could have been due to a number of reasons evil one's home planet which the military called serpo was in the zeta reticuli system almost 40 light years from earth the Ebens used wormhole technology to travel and send messages back and forth. After Ebu-1 died in 1952, the Air Force tried but was unable to reverse engineer other alien technology. But they did have a working communicator. So the Air Force continued to send messages for years. The persistence paid off. Eventually, they received a reply and two-way communication between Earth and Serpo continued for a long time. The Ebens even learned to speak broken English. After learning about the crashes, the Ebens wanted their crew's bodies back, but the military being the military wanted something in exchange. Oh, let me guess, they wanted technology. Yep, but the Ebens said it would be too dangerous to give humans their technology. I could have told them that. So the Ebens suggested a compromise. The military would return the bodies of the alien crew. In exchange, an Eben would come to Earth and assist the US Army. And 12 humans could spend 10 years on planet Serpo. This became known as Project Serpo, though its actual name is Project Crystal Knight. And so began the first intergalactic exchange program in history. How much should good car insurance cost you a month? $80? $120? Nope. The training was intense and long, a year. Colonel McKeever thought special forces had a difficult training program, but it was nothing like this. There were the usual physical exercises and classroom training, they trained in survival, escape and evasion techniques, weapons, explosives, and intelligence gathering. They also learned about Eben history and Eben biology. 
but there was aggressive and invasive psychological training and testing. McKeever remembered one unusually difficult exercise designed to test the team's ability to cope with isolation and confined spaces. Team members were buried seven feet underground, one at a time, in a seven by five foot box for five days. No lights, no way to communicate, only a small air hole and food and water. Everybody passed this test, but some people really struggled with it. Oh, come on. Five by seven feet is a palace. Grow up here. During training, McKeever got to know his team. There were scientists, linguists, pilots, two doctors, and a security officer. They all received general training and training geared toward their specialty. For example, the pilots were taught how to fly an even aircraft. This was surprisingly easy and apparently a lot of fun. The Evens returned to Earth in 1964 to retrieve the bodies. This happened at Holloman Air Force Base in New Mexico. And there's actually footage of that landing. About a year later, in July 1965, the team traveled to Groom Lake, near Area 51, for the landing. At 6 a.m., the Evens ship landed. Several Evens came out to meet the team of 12 and about 16 military officials. The human team was allowed to bring whatever they needed for the stay. They brought 40 tons of gear, including 10 motorcycles and three Jeeps. Everything was easily loaded using anti-gravity technology. Now, lucky for us, McKeever was ordered to keep diary. Okay, we loaded everything and it fits, but we have to transfer all of it to the bigger ship once we get to the rendezvous point. Really excited about this. No reservations by anyone. The training commander asked all members to make a final decision. The team all said go. We go. Interior of EBA craft is big. There are three levels. This is different than the one we trained on. I think that was a scout craft. This one is a shuttle craft. The shuttle flew into a large ship. McKeever wrote that the shuttle bay ceiling was about 100 feet high. It would take almost 10 months to get to Serpo. The human team was escorted to the area where they would be spending the next 270 days. Each team member was assigned a small pod, each with a single chair, no seat belts or harnesses. McKeever was surprised that gravity was consistent. He was expecting to be weightless. Then he saw a light panel change from white to red. He assumed this meant they were moving. His eyes became blurry, the room started to spin, and then he blacked out. The journey was difficult. The human team spent a large part of 10 months sick. They would often become dizzy and sometimes physically ill. During one part of the journey, and even gave the humans a cloudy liquid that tasted like chalk and a cookie or a biscuit that had no taste at all. But when they ate it, they felt better almost instantly. After a while, the human team was allowed to move around the ship. We were able to walk around the ship, but it's so large, it's difficult to understand how such a large ship can move so fast. 633 wants to see the engines. Our guide takes four of us to the engine room, or whatever they wish to call the room. It contains large, very large metal containers. They are in a circle, with the ends of each pointing into the center. Many pipes or some type of large tubes connects them. In the center of these containers is a copper-colored coil, or something looking like a coil. There's a bright light being shined from a point above into the center of the coil. We hear a very dull hum, but no major loud sounds. 661 thinks it is a negative matter versus positive matter system. One day, toward the end of the journey, McKeever got out of his pod and asked the assistant commander, team member 203, to round up the team. 203? Yep. Team members were now required to refer to each other by their number and not their name. Oh, because they were dipped in the, uh, the sheep thing? Sheep dipped. So 203 rounds up the team, but there's a problem. One of the pilots, team member 308, is missing. McKeever asks what happened to 308. One of the Evens says, Earth man not alive. Uh-oh. McKeever asks to see him, but the Evens say that's not possible. The security officer, team member 899, says, I'm going to get the guns. Part of the gear the human team brought included weapons. They were each issued a rifle, they had handguns, they also had grenades and C4 explosives. 899 begins to storm off when a female Eben, who speaks very good English, says, please, no guns. She explains that 308's body is in quarantine until they can figure out what happened. The Ebens allow the human doctors, 700 and 754, to examine the body. They determine 308 died from an embolism. 
but the Evens want him to remain quarantined. McKeever agrees, as long as 308 can be given a proper burial on Serpo. Not long after that, the humans are instructed to return to their pods and prepare for landing, which they do. There must be something about jumping in and out of a wormhole that's hard on human anatomy, because McKeever blacks out again. Boy, this guy really can't hold his wormhole. Six hours later, his pod opens and his team walks to the door. Slowly, the door opens. The door opens and bright light washes into the craft. The team members were issued heavy-duty sunglasses, like those worn during nuclear bomb tests. They quickly put them on. The first thing McKeever noticed was the heat. He asked one of the scientists, team member 633, to check the temperature. 107 degrees Fahrenheit. The landscape is barren. There are hills in the distance, but no vegetation. Just soil and rock and blue sky above. McKeever thinks it looks like Arizona or New Mexico. One major difference, two suns in the sky. McKeever's report supposedly has several thousand photographs and even film. Unfortunately, these haven't been leaked, except for one photo, the two sons of Serpo. Serpo is in the Zeta Reticuli binary star system. Because of its two suns, Serpo is never in complete darkness. According to the report, Serpo has one main sun that the planet orbits, the second sun is farther away. A large number of Evens have gathered for the arrival. They're all a little over four feet tall, and the human team can't really tell them apart unless they're wearing different clothing. A female Even, who they designate Eba 2, introduces herself as translator and guide. The human team is escorted through an Even village to where they'll be staying. And for a technologically advanced species, the way the Evens live appears somewhat primitive. There are only about 650,000 Evens on the planet who live in small communities. At the center of each community is a large tower about 300 feet high. On top of the tower is what looks like a mirror. The humans learn that this tower is how Evens tell time. This was a difficult adjustment because the Even day is 40 hours long, not 24. And with there never being darkness, it was hard to adapt their schedules. Even families were similar to Earth's, typically a female and a male with two children. Families were only allowed to have two children, and children were rarely seen. They mature very quickly and are isolated while they're young. The even homes were small domes that reminded the team of adobe houses in the southwest. The humans finally arrive at their accommodations. Iba 2 leads us to a series of huts, looking like adobe-style houses. There are four. Behind them is an underground room or storage area. It is built into the ground, underground. We have to walk down a ramp. The doors look like military igloos that store our atomic bombs in Earth. All our gear taken off the spaceship is stored there. We walked down into this area. Very large room. Very cool. A lot cooler. We might have to sleep here. All our gear is there. 16 pallets of gear. This igloo is made up of something like concrete, but not the same texture. Feels like soft rubber, but still hard. The floor is made up of the same stuff. There are lights in the ceiling. Looks like spotlights. They have electricity. Each home was equipped with an electrical device that looks like a small piece of plexiglass. No matter what's connected to it, the device outputs the correct amount of voltage. These devices could power a small handheld radio or an entire home without a problem. Supposedly, one of these devices was recovered from Roswell, but scientists haven't been able to reverse engineer this technology. Allegedly. Right. Now that they're finally on the planet, McKeever requests the body of team member 308 so they can Allegedly. give him a proper burial. Eba 1 takes McKeever to a building that looks like a medical facility. An even doctor meets them at the door. He speaks English almost perfectly. McKeever says he wants 308's body. The even doctor is confused. He says you can't have him. McKeever says, give us our man or we'll take him by force. Eba 2 jumps in. She says it's not that they don't want to return 308's body, it's that they can't. The doctor confirms this and says we're using him. McKeever asks what he means. The doctor casually says, well, we're cloning him and using him to create hybrids. Peacock is the exclusive streaming home of Oppenheimer, winner of seven Academy Awards. I see why most of you need an external source to believe in. I see why you need this, this crutch. Because to hear some shit like this, and you would just feel, I guess, hella insignificant and you just an animal on this farm infinite galaxy right and the aliens can just abduct you and breed you and inevitably the biologics the clone they make of you it will inhabit an energy 
Therefore, it will have a spirit or a soul, right? And a consciousness like soul. It's like at that point, who is your God? I mean, I already know that here, though. I know that here. I know I'm indigenous, aboriginal to the to the planet. I know I know things. I know that it's a group of people that haven't been on the planet no longer than six or seven thousand years, and all these scientists and biologists agree upon the same thing. I know. I don't even know if I should get into all. <laughs> now I'm gonna spare y'all that. Let's continue, because you will get offended. It's the truth, though. I see it here. I see we've been here, and it's a species here that ain't been around no longer than six or seven thousand years, but yet they here, and yet they walk and they alive, right? They body and have a, a energy or a spirit. So it's like if aliens, the Zachariah sent you, your cool subplanter planted you here on the planet to do a bidding that you did. Wouldn't that be your God? I'm telling you, it's real. It's facts. It's people we walk on a planet with people that. It's the same thing here. It's no difference. It's not surprising to me. I see it. I see it in the present. I can project the future. I see the past. Be looking like in the dark ages. How can you do all that kind of... How can you... I don't understand it. So therefore, I stand under it. And I understand it's not the same. And I understand that they genetics... And they try to generalize and make it seem like everybody got this 98.7 naturally violent chimpanzee. Which isn't truth. And I understand that your psychological state is directly connected to your genealogy. And then when I look at the history of what these people did and do and done, and I don't understand it, like, how can you be so soulless? Well, I'm, we're here on the planet with people like that. I hope you know that. Walking around, NPC, GTA, pedestrian, beta, cuck, sim, and seal, no internal dialogue. So it's not surprising. It's a fact. But yet, everybody still come together to agree upon that thing. Like, oh, we all come from the same thing. That's not true. If you want to get to the larger scheme of things, like, okay, let's say the source is this, and then it's aliens, and then aliens got free will to create man of their image as well. But still, though, that, who's your creator? <laughs> this is real. Ain't nobody coming just pen and pad and shit like this. Not it's real. And it sound crazy, but it sound crazy when you're thinking what the programming we were subjected to growing up and indoctrinated with. But when you step outside of that box... You understand, like it's it's whatever. Like life is like that. Anything you create, you can just. It's, let's continue though. <laughs> Obviously, cloning a member of the team without permission was a problem. That's fucked but up. But McKeever heard the doctor out. And even it was considered a great honor to donate your body to science for experimentation and cloning. McKeever doubted he could do much about the situation. The Evens were peaceful, but they did have a military. If they wanted to put the humans in prison, or worse, McKeever knew there wasn't much he could do about it. We were only 11 military personnel. We had no way of fighting the Evens. We did not come 40 light years to start a war with the Evens, a war we could not win. We could not even win a simple fist fight with the Evens. Even if we could, what then? So with the help of EBA 2, the doctor agrees that 308's body will not be used anymore. Not that it mattered much. The doctor said all of 308's blood, organs, tissue, and everything was used to create new creatures. McKeever said, show me. In a small anti-gravity aircraft, the human team was flown to a laboratory facility. The inside of the building was completely white. There were a lot of Evens walking around, all wearing blue clothing. And when they were brought to the first lab... There were rolls of containers, looking like glass bathtubs. Inside each bathtub were bodies. I was shocked, as were 7754. Bodies. Strange-looking bodies. Not human bodies, at least not all of them. We started walking down the space between the tubs. We looked into the tubs. These were hideous looking creatures. The first creature I see inside the tub looks like a porcupine. It appears to have a tube placed inside of it. The tube leads to a box underneath the tub. The next creature looks like nothing I can compare it to. It has blood red skin, two spots in the middle, maybe eyes, no arms or legs. It had a very strange odor. The next creature was human-like, but the skin was white, not skin white, the color white. The skin was wrinkled. The head was large with two eyes, two ears, and a mouth. The neck was very small. The head looked almost as if it sat on the lower torso. 
The chest was thin, with large bone-like protrusions. The arms were curled with hands, but no thumbs. The legs were also curled with feet, but only three toes. I couldn't look at any more creatures. Next, they went to what the doctor called a growing room. Here they used parts of different species, including parts of the dead human, to create new- You see that? These Ebens probably then went 80 billion light years away at a point of time. It collected biologics, came back, then came to Earth, collected biologics, mixed it what? That's what it sounded like. He mixed it with a bunch of different aliens from a bunch of different Milky Ways and galaxies and made a Milky Way. This is, bro, this is insane. Like, <laughs> I see why some people close this shit out and like, nope, Allah. Because some of this shit can literally make your head pop. I get it, bro. I get it. This is crazy, bro. And people can even speculate and come up with other things. What is their reasons for doing this? And what if the U.S. military sent these people here for the 10 years and all that, and they come back with their notes and all that? What if they got something like some kind of secret pack going on with these events? Like when the time is right, the Ebens show back up and drop all these ugly, hideous, demonic looking creatures off here on Earth. And then we down here fighting them like the Avengers. It gotta be something going on. It ain't just that and we creating them man. they in these pods. When you do take it out the pie and it's ready, what you're gonna do with it? I think they're gonna drop them off here on Earth or maybe even other planets and try to take over. Who knows? <laughs> it's just something to think about. Who knows? I know they ain't create these entities to walk amongst them. They probably got some sick, twisted plan with the U.S. as well. Like, when they ready, we're going to drop them off, and you're going to see a bunch of demonic-looking Pikachus. New species. Eva Chu said that parts of the blood and other organs are used to mix a substance that's placed inside the bodies. That was all Eva Chu could explain in English. They were breathing. They look like humans, most of them. Two of the beings on the end look like humans with dog heads. These beings were not awake. They were either sleeping or drugged. They find look like humans with dog heads. Have you ever heard about the aliens? I don't know what's the name for, but it got a human body and a cat head, a human body, a tiger head, and it wouldn't be surprising. A human body and a bear head. There's no earth is not even just earth, just creation, period. And then the infinite domain of things, and you here and you can do whatever the fuck you want. Like, them too. It's like it's all... Bro. It don't sound far-fetched. I've been hearing about the aliens that got like... A, you got centaurs. <laughs> this shit is crazy. We may see it in this lifetime. Finally arrived at a growing chamber that contained an entity that was created using parts of 308's body. I was shocked. This being, with our teammates' blood and cells, looked like a large Eben, but the hands and legs were similar to humans. How could they have grown this being so quick? Obviously, this is well above our intelligence. I saw all I wanted to see. I told the doctor that we would like to leave. Eba Chu saw that I was upset and touched my hand. Instantly, I felt concerned. We traveled outside this building, a building that I did not wish to see again. I saw the dark side of this civilization. The Ebens are not the humane civilization we thought they were. They ain't humans, right? <laughs> Your favorite sliders are back at Frisch's. Get two humane. sliders, fries, and a drink for only eight ninety nine. Oh man, Earth just as bad. Because of the misunderstanding of Eben time, the ten year mission was actually thirteen years. During that time, McKeever and his team learned a lot about Eben culture. Eben life was very regimented. As children mature, they're tested for aptitude and placed in jobs to which they're most suited. All Ebens work part of the day, they rest part of the day, and even pray part of the day. Though the team never could figure out what kind of religion or spiritual beliefs they had. All manufacturing took place away from the Eben homes. Same with agriculture. Let me know, do you think they Christians? Do you think they praying to Allah? And let me know who you think they're praying to. Evens grew all their food hydroponically. The human team had taken about two years worth of food with them, and when that ran out, they tried to get accustomed to even food, which wasn't easy. 
Everything tasted like paper or chalk. Ooh, it sounds like they learned how to cook for my second wife. Her cooking was terrible. How bad was it? Her cooking was so bad, we prayed after the meal. Good one. No, I tell you, her cooking was bad. How bad was it? Her cooking was so bad, the flies chipped in for a screen door. Ooh, her cooking was bad. How bad was it? Her cooking was so bad, I left dental floss in the kitchen and all the roaches hung themselves. <laughs> I got a million of them. <laughs> Evens are vegetarian, but the humans wanted meat and there were animals on the planet. As I mentioned before, the Evens allowed us to kill the beasts for meat. The meat isn't really bad. 899 says it tastes like bear, which I never ate. But Evens look at us very strange when we eat meat. They allow us to do just about anything we want, and eating meat is something we need for the protein. We use the last of our salt and pepper. He said we. Understand, it wasn't nothing of me up there that went to this planet. It wasn't no neuromelanated God. It wasn't me. They need meat with the blood in it and for the protein and that shit. We don't. We're not the same. When you look at that, biolog that biology book, bro, it's, it's the standardized Caucasian ph physiology, bro, and biology. It's not... And, it, and it's a difference. We're not the same. It's a difference. That's an understatement. It's a difference. I don't have fruit, fly, chimpanzee, zebra, fish, and all that. You may have antigens on your blood due to what happened to your ancestors, like rape, all that kind of shit. And you, but it's a difference by far. You know how the Evens are different species from you? We're a different species as well. Um, interesting. You need the meat for its protein. My kind don't need no meat. We don't. Even though a lot of that is forced on them and they indoctrinated with what they, and then they just so wrapped around what they like. And it's tradition at this point. Oh, barbecue and all that or whatever. But back then and really knowing, knowing thyself, you eat according to your genetic makeup. It was upon a time they just perform autotropis and eat from the sun like the plants and right that's crazy me meat then you know who was up there though it wasn't these pepper which does make eating their meat. food more of a challenge Boss. the evens don't have anything similar they do have an herb as we call it something like oregano which they use it has a tart taste but we have developed a taste for it the evens don't use money all Ebens are required to work their assigned job and contribute to the community. There was a council of governors that controlled every single activity and every minute detail of the Ebens' lives. Food, clothing, furniture, everything is supplied. The Ebens go to a central distribution center and make a request, and we're given anything that they need. You know, I noticed every time we do an alien story, they turn out to be hippie communists. Well, maybe it's a better way of life. Oh yeah, better for the people in charge. The humans noticed they were getting a heavy dose of radiation from the two suns, and the heat was unbearable. It was consistently 120 to 130 degrees. Eventually, the humans were allowed to move further north. The climate was much more comfortable there, in the 60s and 70s, and it was actually green. This environment didn't suit the Evens, but the humans loved it. After 13 years, the mission ended and eight of the 12 team members returned. Like? 308 died on the way, and a pilot died in a vehicle crash. Two team members decided to stay on Serpo. When the remaining team members returned to Earth, they were quarantined and debriefed for an entire year. They were given new identities and large cash bonuses. Six team members retired and two returned to active duty. Most of the team developed illnesses due to the high dose of radiation they received on the planet and died pretty young. Colonel McKeever, the last survivor- Due to the radiation, that in itself, you see how they moved further up north from the Evens and the Evens didn't like that or wasn't good for them, but so the evens will the heats did they specify on their the color of the evens or whatever so i'm assuming that's okay and they went further up north so i guess it was cooler and they died pretty young when they got back due to radiation exposure too much from the sun from the suns two suns that can't happen to me I don't need suntan lotion. I can't go blind sun gazing at the sun. You will never see me getting melanoma. It's not possible. Um, the radiation. The radiation. I am radiation. The, the sun unlocked my doormat DNA. 
and too much sun and radiation break people's down just know that it's like they're like I'm telling you they try to generalize and put us all in a collective like this is it this is we're all human we're all this. no it's not and I see that with the biology thing. I see that when your genealogy is directly connected to your psychological state. I see it in your history. I try to understand. Why would someone create a brazen bull, a Judas cradle, scaphicism, bird eagle? Why would And doing it to your own people, eating your own people, cannibalism in the dark ages. The, the Europe situation with terrible hygiene, and it was normal for you guys. And it was, you, you was dwelling in it for decades until... A people decided to help you out and show you how to clean yourself in. I see it. I see the biologics. I see the, how they think, and I don't understand it, so therefore I stand under it, and I see it with the history. I see the, the present as well, so I can project the future. That's some of y'all ain't gonna know what I'm talking about. If you don't know what I'm talking about, it's not for you, but let's continue. Having team member retired to Florida. He passed away in 2002. But he leaves what is perhaps the most important legacy in human history, a 3,000 page report detailing every aspect of traveling to and living on an alien planet. Yet there are no monuments to him, no statues, no schools or streets bear his name. Colonel McKeever volunteered for this dangerous mission, not for personal glory, but in service to all Americans and the entire human race. Maybe one day he'll be recognized as a great man, but sadly that day is not today. R.I.P. him. The Project Serpo story has become legendary in the UFO community. It's firmly part of the lore. But is it real? To get to the truth of the Serpo like story, there is a lot to unravel. And there are a couple of theories. The Project Serpo saga began in November 2005 when someone named Request Anonymous emailed Victor Martinez, who ran a UFO mailing list. Anonymous said he was a retired US government employee who was involved in a special program. Over the next nine months, he detailed the story you heard today. In the description, I'll link to a PDF of all his emails. It's 130 pages and covers every possible detail you can think of. The anonymous emails caused all kinds of drama. There was infighting, accusations, threats, and even a little bit of blackmail. The fighting all came down to, was Anonymous telling the truth? And if not, who was he and why was he doing this? After some excellent sleuthing from a couple of tech savvy mailing list members, at least five separate email accounts, including Anonymous, were traced back to one man, the infamous Richard Doty. Doty, this guy again? Yep. If you've seen our episodes about Paul Benowitz and Dulce Base, you'll be familiar with the name. Doty was an Air Force intelligence agent who specialized in spreading UFO disinformation. He specifically targeted Paul Benowitz, an Albuquerque businessman who thought he was intercepting messages from aliens. Doty also used respected UFO researchers like Bill Moore to spread disinformation throughout the entire UFO community. Five different accounts, including Doty's, were emailing from the same internet provider from the same neighborhood in New Mexico. Now, to be fair to Doty, he admits to being part of the disinformation campaign but he also says that almost everything in the campaign was true. Roswell, abductions, underground bases, and even the Project Serpo Intergalactic Exchange Program. He said everything happened. When confronted about the IP address issue, he got very angry and said, Hold on, I can't skip over that. Did you, you see this ugly ass guy? We're not the same. Our biologics is not the same. Our thought process is not the same. The skull is not the same. I'm indigenous aboriginal. How long I've been here exceed that six or seven thousand years when he got here by far. Can't begin to figure out how old my neuromelanin is. And yes, it is relevant because your genealogy is directly connected to your psychological state. Take it a step further. How long you been here? Not even just epigenetic memory. Um how can I? I have more storage. I have more data in my vessel than you have in yours. You just got that. Yeah, if you know what I'm talking about, let's continue. Everything in the campaign was true. Roswell, abductions, <laughs> underground bases, and even the Project Serpo Intergalactic Exchange Program. He said everything happened. When confronted about the IP address issue, he got very angry and said that he could spoof any IP address he wanted to. Well, if that's true, 
Why didn't he? Because in my opinion, before Doty was exposed, Doty didn't realize email headers contained IP addresses, nor did he know that IPs could be spoofed. Eventually, the Serpo story exposed what was called the Team of Five. Christopher Green, Harold Putoff, Richard C. Doty, Victor Martinez, and Bill Ryan. Several of them worked for the CIA and military intelligence. All of them contributed to the Serpo lore in some way. But did they create the lore? Probably not. Even though Richard Doty and the Team of Five propagated and added to the Serpo lore, a story about an alien exchange program has existed since the 1950s or 60s. In 2006, when Serpo was lighting up the UFO forums, a user named Chapman weighed in. He said he was formerly of the British Ministry of Defense and said he saw the Serpo files. Yes, the files were real, but the events described in them were not. Chapman said the original Serpo story was created by Alice Bradley Sheldon. She had a successful career as a science fiction writer under the pseudonym James Tiptree Jr. She published a lot of books over a lot of years and was inducted into the Science Fiction Hall of Fame. She also happened to work for the CIA. During World War II, she worked for military intelligence and reached the rank of major, which was very high for women at the time. After the war, she joined the CIA. In the early 60s, the Soviets had successfully convinced the US government that they had nuclear weapons hidden on American soil. The nukes were supposedly in abandoned mines near large American cities and could be activated by sleeper agents. This wasn't true, but it wouldn't be completely disproved until 1980. Project Serpo was a response to this piece of intelligence. The CIA wanted to scare the Russians into thinking the United States had acquired advanced technology and was becoming friendly with aliens, and the Soviets might want to think twice about detonating a nuclear weapon. At first, the Serpo story worked. The KGB was- And that's just not a here thing. It could be the Ebens as well, or it could have been other extraterrestrials that came to the other governments being Vladimir, being all the way there in China, whatever. They're they not the only ones that didn't exchange their citizens for technology. And they got technology that'll do this planet wonders. And yet they try to fake and act like they going against each other with nuclear war here. So a lot of that shit is really primitive due to what they really got or what they really can do, their capabilities. So all this shit is a... It's a movie, it's people knowing their roles and playing their roles and acting it out. So I look like things are predicted because it's just a script that's been written and with dates and gematria and numerology and everything is in numbers. It's ironic that they expelled their names and called them numbers instead. And every number is attached to a letter or vice versa. And inevitably, every number carries an energy. And yeah, if this kind of... Sh well, it is. If it's going on here, just know it's going on elsewhere as well. That's crazy. I was nervous, but the story became more convoluted and started to sound like a cheesy sci-fi novel. This made the KGB suspicious. Then the CIA added photographs to the story. The Russians didn't buy it. The Serpo story had been forgotten for years, but resurfaced when Richard Doty and the Air Force perpetrated a very aggressive disinformation campaign against the UFO community. The purpose of this campaign was to flood the community with more and more outlandish stories. Eventually, UFO believers didn't know what was true and what wasn't. Some UFO researchers turned on each other. It was chaos and a highly successful intelligence operation. Then, over the years, Richard Doty goes from counterintelligence agent to UFO believer to keynote speaker at UFO conventions. A part of me wants to believe him, to give Doty the benefit of the doubt. He claims to this day to have nothing to do with Serpo. But if he's telling the truth, why is he making fake internet accounts? Why is he flooding the internet with the Serpo story? When Anonymous aka Richard Doty began posting about Serpo, the story was simple. But then it got more and more elaborate. Anonymous was even answering questions from the group. What this did was flood the group with outlandish information. The members didn't know what to believe and they turned on each other. The same operation Doty ran in the 80s, and the same result. There is no physical evidence to prove that Serpo actually happened. But there's also no evidence to debunk it. We don't know for sure if it was made up by the CIA. Whether you believe it's true or you believe it's fake, it doesn't really matter. All we have are theories. We do know that Zeta Reticuli is a binary star system, but it's what's called a wide binary system. The stars are a light year apart, so there's no way that photo is correct. Also, it's highly unlikely that humans could eat food on an alien planet. 
in such a different biome, literally everything would be toxic. But Whitley Schrieber, Bob Lazar, and a few other whistleblowers say Serpo happened. Betty and Barney Hill are maybe the most famous UFO abductees of all time. And they said the aliens who abducted them were from Zeta Reticuli. Are all these people lying? Are they just building on a story that has evolved over the past 60 years? Or is there a planet out there somewhere inhabited by an intelligent race of beings living in peace, caring for one another, thinking back fondly on the time the strange earth creatures came to visit? And if the Ebens are real, you can't help but wonder, what does that alien human hybrid look like? Today's episode is brought to you by one of the most unique sponsors we've ever had, Established Titles. That doesn't sound like VPN software. It's not. Huh, that's nice it. change of pace. Established Titles let you buy. Okay, that's it for this video. It was interesting. Let me know what you think. Let me know if you would have went or you would have stayed. Me personally, I'm staying. I ain't fucking with no even. Even if they got peace. Nah, that's crazy. Yeah, nah. I'm staying. <sighs> That's it for this video, man. Oh, I thought I liked the video. Don't forget to like the video. If you like the video, comment, share, subscribe, turn on post notifications, DM me the link via X, formerly known as Twitter. Let me know what you want me to react to next or what you want me to talk about. Follow me on Twitch, Kick and Rumble. I'll see you on the next video, man. I'm out.